Yeah, by way of uh, introduction, uh, what we're talking about here is uh, uh, segmented turning. And we're not going to go through, you know, how you calculate the length of segments and stuff like that. That's a whole separate uh, session by itself. What we're going to go through is, is a, a methodology that Al Conard and Al Osterman and I have been using for, what, a couple of years now, Al? Uh, that seems to do the job pretty well for us. Now, I'd like to point out that when you talk about segmented uh, turning, uh, uh, there's no right way or wrong way. There are just different ways, and some work better than others. So the methods that, you know, that some of our other club members use are fine for them. Uh, they work well for them, and they should probably stick with them. But for us, uh, we decided to adopt this wedgie sled system because we wanted to reduce the potential for uh, error in the segments that we're cutting. Um, th typically, with uh, segmenting systems, you have to do a lot of sanding. And if you look at some of the stuff that you'll see on, on the internet, uh, you'll see guys that'll go through a tremendous amount of work setting up jigs and stuff for disc sanders. Uh, we had a guy here a couple of years ago that is a professional segment turner, a guy named Kurt Theobald. And his sanding operations were just awesome. You know, he has, you know, sanders all over his shop, and every piece gets sanded down to, to the nth degree. And he gets perfection out of it. Well, that's not really what we're after. We're after something that gives us a reliable result where we don't have to do any sanding or, or minimal amount of sanding and be able to produce our product without having to take days and days and days to put them together. Uh, this is the... Uh, the, 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 the heart of the system. Uh, this is called a wedgie sled, and if you'll notice, uh, this is the sled off my saw. And, and by the way, the reason that we're uh, 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 approaching this the way they are, that we are, uh, the, uh, uh, the sleds are specific to your table saw. Uh, they may or may not work with other saws. For example, the distance between the miter slot and the blade on Kelly's saw, which uh, we have Kelly's uh, job site saw here today, may be different than it is on my saw stop, and it may be different than it is on, on, on Al's rigid saw, and it may be even more different on uh, the uh, uh, unisaw that Al Osterman's been using for the last several years. So you build the sled according to uh, your table saw, and there is a, a, a fairly complete set of instructions uh, available for the uh, uh, sled, uh, and we were going to uh, make copies of them and make them available to you, but it's 10 pages. Uh, so what we decided to do is there's a sign-up sheet back there, a little clipboard. If anybody wants copies of the instructions for building the wedgie sled, uh, sign up back there and I'll email them to you uh, sometime during the week. Uh, the uh, Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for instance, this guy wants you to build him out of Corian. Uh, I don't deal with Corian, and to get a you know a piece of Corian large enough might be a little bit of a trick unless you know somebody that's in the in the uh, uh, cabinet build, uh, business. But uh, I built mine out of plywood. And, uh, you know, it's half-inch plywood, and it's, you know, they specify Baltic birch. I don't have Baltic birch available, so I, I, I bought this out of the, uh, uh, or built this rather out of the best plywood that I could find. Uh, uh, Al, and, and uh, Al Osterman and Al Conard both built theirs out of MDF. And MDF is good. Uh, it works just fine. Just be careful that when you're doing the routing uh, on the back side of the sled uh, of the dust from the MDF. Uh, the dust is a killer, but, you know, uh, they both followed the plans. Uh, that I think the, the, you followed the plans that you were talking about, not the plans that I have. And their, their sleds came out very accurate. So uh, one of the things that I've heard people say about the wedgie sled system is, that well, it costs a lot of money. It can. Uh, you can spend any amount of money that you want to on this stuff. Um, for example, the uh, inventor... What the guy did is he came up with this system, and he uh, uh, put the plans out there and the, the method for building the sled free. So you can, you can build the sled for minimal cost. What costs money are the wedges. Uh, these are uh, uh, precision milled. Uh, they're, they're done on a CNC system. 
and uh, he gets what forty nine dollars for four of them, and there are two sets, so you could spend a hundred bucks pretty easy uh, on his wedge system. But the other thing that he did, uh, I guess, to be a nice guy or to get people hooked on his system, is you can get one of these for six bucks at Office Depot. And this will get you started with a very simple uh, drafting triangle. It's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Uh, this is all you need to get started to do a 12 segment ring. And the way that it works is you slide the, uh, the triangle uh, in until it contacts the fence on both sides. Tighten your fence down. and you're set to go. Uh, that's really all there is to it. And uh, in a few, s few minutes here, we're going to cut some pieces on, uh, on Kelly's saw. Uh, but uh, be careful when you buy. There's actually a $3 version of this. Don't buy the $3 version. We found out that it's the 90 degrees is only 88 and a half. <laughs> And Al Osterman uh, came up with one someplace, and he couldn't get the rings to fit right. Because if you take uh, a half a degree error uh, on each segment times 12, uh, you've got basically a six degree error all the way around. So you're going to wind up, you know, basically defeating the purpose of buying the wedgie sled in the first place is not to have to do a lot of sanding. You have to do a lot of sanding to get the rings to mate up. Uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here in terms of the rings, I've got several that uh, uh, we put together. Uh, these are sample rings that, that, that either one of the owls made or I made. I'm just going to pass them around. And the uh, bands are tight on them. Don't loosen the bands uh, <laughs> because these are not glued together. But uh, just to give you an idea about you know, how tight the rings can be uh, and uh, you know, how, how, how tight the segments are getting. And these were all done uh, with the wedgie sled system and the only sanding we did is when you run it through the saw, you'll always get a little bit of tear out, a little bit of fuzzy where the saw exits, even with a zero clearance insert. That's all you have to sand off. Uh, so my sanding stick, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, this, this, is, this is my sander. Uh, it's a stick with a piece of sandpaper on it. And all I do when the, the you know, when, after they've got all my segments cut, like that. And that takes care of it. And sometimes, depending on the wood and depending on how dull my blade is, uh, that's another thing, sharp blade. I always have a sharp blade. <laughs> Uh, depending on how dull my blade is, I may have to knock off the corners, but I never have to adjust the angle. And, you know, that's really what we were trying to get away from, uh, was having to adjust the angle all the time to correct for errors in the sawing. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that is possible to do with this system uh, is to do uh, some design work that you might have great difficulty doing otherwise. I'm going to pass around a couple of examples of that. Uh, this is a ring that Al Osterman made, and it's basically just a ring. I'm not, you know, it, it's, uh, but it shows you one of the capabilities of the system. One of the nice things about this system is, is that you can not only take the blade at 90 degrees, you can also uh, uh, do angle cuts. And as long as you're consistent with the cut, in other words, you know, you, you know once the blade is set, you leave it there. Uh, for you know cutting the rest of the segments in the ring it's going to give you an accurate result and the other nice thing about the wedgie sled system is you don't have to cut rings that are or, or segments for rings that are are, are uh, uh, polygons you can actually cut them you know at angles you'll see some of that in uh, in some of these rings that we're passing around here like uh, these were cut at at a, at a pretty fair angle 
And somebody said, well, you know, what good does that do you? Because when you turn it, all you see is the edge anyway. Well, that's not quite true, because if this is towards the top of a vessel where it's starting to slope in, you're going to see this, you know, this angle reproduced. And it does give you a really nice effect. And, you know, just to give you an indication of how it works when you want to set a different angle, that, that's why you have n adjustment knobs on each, on each one of the fences. Okay. See what happens when I slide? It adjusts the angle that the wedge is sitting at, but on both sides of it, it's in firm contact with the fence. So I can, I can do actually a pretty radical angle with this. And as long as I lock my fences down uh, so that you know, they're, you know, they don't move, I'm going to get a consistent result out of it and be able to get these angled cuts. Let's, uh, let's set up and do a couple of pieces, Al. Uh, I can do them. Let's, uh, You can also do, uh, I probably should have mentioned this a minute ago, this is the stop. They call it a saw stop. I don't think they cleared that with saw stop, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, once you build your stop, uh, you can set the, the length of the segment according to a sample, according to a, a, a ruler. Uh, some guys actually build a ruler into the stop so that if we need uh, a segment that is uh, one and three eighths inches long, which is what this one is. Uh, you simply measure one and three eighths inches uh, in the stop. Oh, that's right. That doesn't have a zoom on it, does it? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, I adjust this back and forth until you know I get the measurement I want and pull this out and this will give me a segment that is one and three eighths inches that again is one of the reasons why it is specific you have to build it for your saw but there are instructions online and in the publication that we have uh, that'll that'll step you through that yeah right Yeah, one thing also that, again, is specific to the saw is you don't have to do this. You can use your regular table saw insert. That'll work just fine. But for added safety, they recommend building uh, a table saw insert that has a ramp on it. And you can see that on the uh, uh, on Kelly's saw, uh, we have a ramp built up by the insert. You, you know, see if you can pull that out and show it to them, Al. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, let's let's uh, pass this one around. Uh, this one, by the way, is is for my. S I have a saw stop uh, cabinet saw, and so this is one that I use not only for the wedgie sled, but for a lot of a, a lot of other cutting that I do on the saw stop. Uh, these are replaceable maple inserts that I make, just out of quarter inch maple, and that way I can always have a zero clearance uh, insert for my blade on my table saw. I've made these for uh, a saw stop. Uh, I made one for my jet that didn't work uh, because the the the, the uh, 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 insert plate for the jet is only an eighth of an inch thick, and you don't get enough material. To, you know, it's not solid enough. But uh, these are fairly easy to make, and if anybody wants uh, uh, to make one of these, uh, I don't own the rights to the plan on them. There's a guy named Ralph Bagnell that actually owns the rights to this, but I'd be happy to hook you up with him. These are fairly easy to make, and they are kind of a labor saver if you do a lot of dado work uh, with your table saw. I've got uh, an insert uh, pre-cut for every one of the, the, the widths of, of, of dado setups that I do. I think I've got 11 or 12 of them. Uh, for different purposes. Mm. 
Okay, let's do a 12-segment uh, uh, ring, and we're going to make. I'm going to use. Oh, when I, every time I cut a, uh, a a design that I think I want to replicate, or a, a segment that I know I'm going to need again, I make an extra one, and I mark the extra one with the width on it. And most of the time, the project that it's designed for. Uh, for instance, my yarn bowls, uh, those yarn bowls that I make only have three sizes of segments. So anytime I'm getting set to make yarn bowls, uh, I get that little uh, box out that's got the segments in it, uh, and I go through and it, you know, that's how I measure to cut the segments. So I'm not always measuring and, and resetting the, uh, uh, the, the stop for it. Okay. That'll give me about, if I remember right, about six inches, I think it is. Huh. There we go. Oh, yeah. Let's cut this at an odd angle. We'll cut this at an odd angle. Yes, there is. Glad you asked. Um, I'm cheap. Uh, <laughs> I don't like to waste wood. There are actually two ways to cut these. You need a line for both of them. Uh, the way that we're going to cut this one is, is what they call grain matching. And that is that the grain will always be going the same direction when you look at the edge of the ring around. The cheap way, and that wastes some wood, by the way, especially if you're cutting, you know, uh, it may not waste so much here, but uh, especially if you're cutting uh, the, the, you know, the rings that I do for the yarn bowls. Um, anytime that you're doing the grain matching, you have to trim off the end. I'll show you what I mean when I actually do the cut here. The other way to do it, and the, this is where the line really helps you, when you go to glue it up, you alternate the segment so you have a line, a blank, a line, a blank, a line, a blank. And that way you're not wasting anywhere near as much wood. Uh, I've got it calculated so that, for instance, on the yarn bowls, to do one of those bowls, I know that I need a board that is five and a half inches wide, 27 inches long, and three quarters of an inch thick. And, and if I were to do the grain matching, I'd probably need a board that would be like maybe three or four inches longer. Uh, I've never really calculated that. But that's the, the, the line serves the purpose. It helps you keep the segments uh, aligned, you know, depending on which way you want to arrange them in the final ring. The one thing I would say, too, about uh, doing it with the grain matching, there is a risk with the grain matching system of getting the, uh, uh, the, the it, uh, depending on any error in your table saw, you can get your uh, segments so they don't lay flat. And with doing the, uh, the, the cheaper method, what they call the economy method, I always get pretty much a perfect match on them because if there's any air in the table saw, by flipping the segment over, it cancels out the air because you've got the same air on both sides that way. Uh, so that's one argument for doing it that way. But I think, you know, most of the time, have you had any problems like that, Al, with getting a, you know, of course, you do them on your, your rigid, right? And, uh, you know, he sets things up, uh, he sets things up with a micrometer. Uh, he's he's pretty exacting about so I'm I tend to be a little bit sloppier than he is I think so oh you did <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway uh, should have brought my earplugs.
there. Just wanted to get those chunks out of the way. Okay, but this is where it gets a little dicey. I don't like to get my fingers too close to the blade. Uh, not quite, but uh, let's let's see let's see if we can get one more out of this. Let me show them a little trick. Yeah, yeah. Right. It is. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, a, a little safety device that, you know, I made out of some scrap wood. And like I say, I'm cheap. I hate to waste, especially some, you know, if you're using exotic materials, you don't want to throw away a chunk like that. So I, l I can get at least one more segment out of this piece of wood. And let's see, we've got three, six. Yeah, we are going to need some more. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut this one and then we'll get another piece of wood up here. <laughs> or not. I didn't have a I didn't have a good hold on it when it started the cut. We'll give it one more try here and see if Yeah. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, but like Al said, on on a, a with a full size saw like you know I, uh, like in a, one of our cabinet saws, we have more room to work. Uh, so we've got you know plenty of space. And also canning it at this angle, I left myself you know, a, a little less uh, space up here to use the safety uh, device on. So, but I think you get the idea.
Yeah, I think that'll do it. Okay. <laughs> you can use my little sander if you want to. Let's see what I do with it. Ah. There we go. You probably noticed that. You can see. Yeah. There's a little bit of fuzz on the thing from the blade, and if you don't take that off, then you put it together. It'll, it'll all right. You just probably noticed that I had a little problem with the sliding. The uh, uh, the tracks. Uh, they they talk you through in the instructions how to make the tracks so that they're adjustable. And this one, we probably could have tightened it up a little bit. Well, we did tighten it up, but I think that just because of the table saw being as small as it is and, and hmm. trying to keep the slit, yeah. I think they were putting it too tight against that. And we dragged the, the, the saw stop with the, with the piece of wood. Yeah. It doesn't happen to my saw. Yeah. Yeah, mine, uh, on my saw, the, uh, the stop... When I put it in, I actually have to press it down into the slot, and it doesn't move. Uh, but it just takes a little bit of tweaking to tighten up these end screws. What the guy does is he cuts the slot, and the slot's offset, so it's not right in the center. It's offset away from the blade. So you have, I've got like a half inch here and a quarter inch here, and drill a hole down the middle of it and, uh, uh, through the slot that you've cut. Drill a hole and then take a uh, an ordinary. Uh, I use you know steel wood screws. I think whether the number four screw is what they suggest, and just put the screw in and start tightening it until I get a nice a nice firm fit. And then you can always tweak it up a little bit. Oh really? Oh. You mean it's not going to be perfect? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And what I've been toying around with the idea of doing is uh, I use uh, uh, cutting boards, uh, the type that you buy at, at Walmart for quite a bit of stuff, and I found out that I've got, you know, a couple of nice strips of cutting boards that are about that wide. So I'm thinking about remaking my saw and making uh, uh, the uh, 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 miter slides uh, for the for the, the especially the sled out of HDPE, which is what cutting boards are, high density polyethylene, and that should eliminate a lot of that problem. Now the the one for the stop, you don't want that to slide, but the other one, that's the other thing I notice here is, and I think it has to do, you know, with with maybe the table surface itself. The sled's a little bit hard to push through. And I I tried to get some of the stuff out of here. Yeah. Like yeah. You, you got to lose. You got to be tight there. Mm hmm But it's a little bit too tight over here. Yeah. Probably could live with that. Yeah. I marked the board and Jerry cut the segment. <laughs> so what uh what you normally yeah. want to do is have this this mark yeah. against the fence. He has hmm. the opposite direction, so yeah. we're gonna change the, the, the grain orientation of the of the segment, but it won't change much. You'll still be able to see how tight it is and stuff. I expect to get written complaints about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right yeah. 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 Just, uh, yeah. Uh, Al and Al Osterman and I all live about, I think we're, what, six minutes apart, yeah. something like that. So, uh, not on a regular basis, because, you know, we're not as organized as the unbalanced six are down in the valley. Uh, but every once in a while we get together and we either work on projects together or we talk about stuff or we sit around and just solve the problems of the world while we drink coffee. So, you know, works out pretty well for us. Uh, let me pass these around. These are some of the stu the ones that, and, and I think Al Osterman did these, uh, that are done by uh, cutting uh, not only uh, the, the segments the way we cut them here, but alternating the way the segments are cut. This one's kind of interesting when you look at it and imagine the possibilities of that if you were to put it into a, a, a bowl or a vessel. Oh, um, well you'll notice here that, um, yeah, there we go, Th that the marks are all on the same side of the of the of the wood here. This is for grain matching purposes. 
you know, when this one's glued together, you'll be able to look at the grain and with very little interruption, you'll have one place where there'll be a big interruption because you can't get them perfect. But, you know, for most of the, the circumference of it, you know, the grain will be continuous around. On the other hand, on this piece, when this one's glued together, you'll notice that the marks are on alternate sides. This one the grain won't match on. The difference is, is that this took, is, uh, uh, even accounting for the difference in the, the circumference, that this took a lot shorter piece of wood. In other words, I was able to get more segments out of this piece of wood so than the other way. What's the difference Well, the difference is, I had to cut off, right, this, this is all waste. And, you know, if you start stacking these together, you know, you know, there's, you know, a pretty substantial amount of wood. And, you know, people, you know, I, you know my, I was explaining this to my wife one day, and she says, what are you talking about? It's only an inch or two. You know, have you priced some of the exotic woods lately? You know, like, what, what was the stuff that the guy made the tool handles out of, Kelly? Bacote. You go price Bacote. You don't want to waste anything. If you could find a way to cut it without having sawdust come out, you'd probably do that because of the expense of the wood. And, you know, and even stuff like, you know, I, I like to use black walnut quite a bit. Well, uh, you know, I used to be able to get away with going over to Menards and pick up a stick of black walnut. And they used to have it. It's just shrink wrap stuff, and it is high priced. It's probably the highest board foot price you're going to pay for lumber anywhere. But still, it's something, you know, that in relatively small quantities was kind of affordable. They don't carry it anymore. Well, you can order it. But for an eight foot long uh, one by six, which is what I was buying before, it's $78 plus $13 shipping plus sales tax on top of that. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm becoming more and more sensitive about how much wood I waste because you can find a lot of wood in a lot of places and some of it still is pretty cheap. But if you're looking for the high quality stuff, especially the exotics, then you're going to pay a significant amount of money. Uh, and uh, explanation, uh, you know, a couple of years ago we had uh, at, at the Woodworkers Guild, we had the fellow from Bennett Hardwoods in Wausau over. And I talked to him, you know, uh, a little bit after that meeting. Uh, and the explanation, uh, for instance, why is black walnut so hard to find? Because there's a lot of black walnut around, and you can find black walnut if you go out looking for it. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of the black walnut that they that Bennett cuts, that the, and that they deal with that they're in their kiln and parade to Shane, is containerized and shipped to the to the Orient. The Asians build stuff out of it and send it back to us to sell it to us. But that's why that one of the reasons why the price of black walnut is so high. And you see, you know, you know, some, especially some of the uh, uh, manufactured products uh, that come from the Orient, from the Asian factories, you know, that are using walnut as an accent material. Well, that walnut doesn't come from over there. They don't have it. Talk to an Englishman sometime about walnut. They kill for walnut. They'll send you any amount of money you want if, you'll, if you can find a way to get walnut to them because they don't have it available in the U.K. So. Yeah, you want to? Sure. Oh, okay. All right.
How many segments did you cut for that one, Al? Okay. <laughs> oh, you, you you copied my method, in other words, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> it, and let's pass this one around too, or these two. These are a couple more that are cut at odd angles. That's the problem with that thing being so damn small. Huh. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you gotta paint it red. Another thing that you can do after you after you make your pieces, you can make some highlighter pieces. So you can take another piece of walnut or whatever, and you can you can make some little pieces so you set your stop. Can I change this here? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. 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 It really depends on, uh, on on how thick a wall you want, because you know, like for instance, on on a a, a closed vessel or a what's going to be a hollow form, uh, you're going to wind up with several different thicknesses depending on the angle uh, that the finished piece is going to be cut at, because you're actually cutting away the width. Uh, but normally I start, you know, like for, you know, the yarn bowls and, and simple little projects like that. They'll, the pieces are, are all either three-quarter inch wide or five-eighths of an inch wide. And what I do to speed up the process and, again, to save on wood, I don't cut the strips. Uh, I don't cut them on the table saw. Uh, I cut them on the bandsaw. My bandsaw, I don't have dumb luck, call it whatever you want, my bandsaw always is cut perfectly straight. I know there aren't very many bandsaws that have ever been made that can say that, but mine does for some reason. So what I do is I just set the fence on my bandsaw uh, to the width that I want, and I keep cutting, you know, the you know the width segments or the width of strips that I need, and that's how I'm able to get you know so much out of a relatively small piece of wood. So I'm not I'm not wasting a lot with the curve of the saw. When I first started doing this, my I had a, uh, a a jet table saw then that would it was using a a, a standard curved blade. I could have never made one of these on that jet, and gotten that you know that much uh, accuracy out of it. Uh, you know, but doing the combination between the bandsaw and the and, and the, the saw stop table saw, uh, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. Is that what they call it? Yeah. yeah. I use that. And then I, I say, okay, my, my wall, I want my wall, my bowl to go like this. So I know how big the pieces have to be. So if I need a bigger piece, then I put a bigger piece. And it all depends on the curvature of the bowl. And that's how I cut my pieces. So mm -hmm. I need a seven inch ring to make that, then I cut a seven inch ring. If I need a four inch ring, a six inch ring. It all depends how big the pieces are. 
Yeah, I had, you know, on the subject of how you determine the, you know, the, the ring size and how much wood you're going to need and so forth, uh, I had, uh, 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 was you know, able to attend the uh, Turn on Chicago Symposium this year. And one of the demonstrators there was a, a, a guy that I actually sat in on, th on three of his demos. It was a guy that does segmenting work named Robin Costell. And his name is, last name is C-O-S-T-E-L-L-E. -E. And if you look up robincostell.com, you can see examples of his work online. Uh, a bunch of us in the room were talking about, well, what kind of software do you use and what kind of an app on your cell phone do you have to have to be able to calculate these ring sizes and stuff? And Robin doesn't do any of that stuff. What he does is he draws a picture of what he wants the bowl to look like. And he uses graph paper so he's able to, you know, count the number of graph segments. And then he sketches out each ring, you know, based on, on the original drawing of, the, of the, the profile of the bowl that he wants. And the thing that was kind of interesting about him, because he's using graph paper and, and you know, and, and cutting them, you know, that way, uh, he doesn't even make the segments the same length. You know, he'll make the segments odd lengths, but his position is as long as it totals up to 360 degrees, who cares, you know, how you did it. And looking at some of his uh, some of his work, like he does, uh, he has a, a, an Indian blanket design that he does for a feature ring around you know the, the, the circumference, the outside edge of a bowl. No two of those are alike, and he intentionally makes them different because he, his explanation is is that when he turns the bowl, he expects to see a different picture, and he does on his stuff. Now you know he's a great. A, a great entertainer. He does a, you know great demos. If you're going to go there to learn technical details from him, you're wasting your time because the guy is completely disorganized. Uh, he always gets to the conclusion that he wants to get to, but you're liable to take a long route to get there through some explanations that, frankly, some of them don't make any sense. But it's his sense of humor actually carries him most of the way through. Um, I'm going to pass these around. This is a. Uh, just two examples of the of, of the high price wedgies, the forty nine dollar set. There are four of these in the set, and this is uh, they're they're marked twenty four and thirty two, and somebody that I know uh, knows some people that have CNC uh, machining capabilities, and somebody that I know took their segments and asked the guy to reproduce them. They didn't work. <laughs> Yeah. And they get different degrees, different angles. If you look at this piece we cut, it, it's a little bit off, but I, I was fooling around with keeping the marks in yeah. the right uh, direction, but I think I got one piece a little bit off. But I just wanted to show you, you cut these little pieces. Like I said, you can take some, some accenting wood and you can insert it anywhere you want. You can pull this apart, stick a piece in there. set your stop to how wide you want them to be. If you want them to be mm -hmm. half an inch, you just set it for a half an inch and just cut them. Or you can make your initial piece that much shorter and come up with the same size. Right. Correct, you yeah. You think about that. If you, if you wanted a six-inch ring and you were going to add you know, another inch, you have to subtract that mm -hmm. much from it. But I'm just doing this just to show you that you can do this. Yeah, it goes back to that thing, you know, that if it, if it adds up to 360 degrees, it'll work. Uh, Mistake when I first started cutting, so yeah, you get you get the idea. You can't pass these around if you do pass them around, just fold them because they're so fold, held together with rubber bands. Yeah, they'll be all over the place. Over. Yeah, you can't have you can pass them around if you'd like. And yeah, the one that you cut there, Sherry, right there. This one, hey, Jerry. yeah, right. when, when you were cutting off those little short pieces, right? yeah, the green the same, yeah. Yeah. And save those little pieces. He's all about saving wood. I yeah. Do too. And I save those cutoffs. It might take about three boards, but I save them, and you can eventually get another ring. 
Mm-hmm. And they'll be all different colors, but it makes a very unique bowl. Yeah, well, for instance, when I make, uh, well, when I make the yarn bowls, the bases for them start out square. And I'm pretty particular about making sure that the bases for them are as close to perfect as I can get it. Because then what I do is I, I've got a jig that I use on the bandsaw that cuts the corners off. I don't throw the corners away because those are perfect little 45, 90 degree angles. And I've got uses for those because you actually can make rings out of those little things too. I haven't, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with all the rings I've got. But, you know, that's where some of this stuff came from. You know, some of the, you know, the, you know, the ones that I've passed around here today. You know, I, I cut them, experimenting with them, and it was, it was too good to throw away, so I hang on to them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but someday I'll find an application for them. You know, and it's nice, if you're, if you're experimenting, for instance, with gluing up, uh, it's nice to have, you know, some pre-cut stuff that you don't have a, a, an immediate need for so you can experiment with your gluing, you know. Uh, so, uh, on the subject of gluing, um, pardon me? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you can. Uh, the manufacturer or the inventor of the sled uh, has a business. He calls it SEGEASY, S-E-G-E-A-S-Y dot com. Uh, they're fairly high priced, but he sells a, uh, a, a gluing rig. Uh, that's specifically for open segment work. I haven't bought any of those yet, but I have a hunch that, you know, as soon as my wife lets me, I will. Uh, do you? No. No, no, I don't believe so. That would require a pretty sophisticated uh, uh, gluing jig. We, uh, we do use this, the stomper. And the stomper is something we're going to get to here in a few minutes. Uh, the, but uh, uh, the open segment work is something you know that I you know I'd look at it and I'd like to do it, but I haven't quite come to the point that I'm ready to start dealing with getting the glue up between the segments, because if you 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 know I I started out in woodworking and building you know cabinets and furniture, and you know the the teacher that I had was a guy who was you know he's he's close to 90 now, was a really top drawer professional a guy you know, taught me an awful lot about this stuff. Well, the way that he would he join wood together, uh, he used uh, conventional white glues or carpenter's glues. Uh, he always expected to see some squeeze out because if it didn't have squeeze out to him, it wasn't a good glue joint. Well, you got to be careful about open segment stuff because that squeeze out is damn hard to get out of there. And there are all kinds of techniques for doing it, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm Yeah, I, I I don't think I have the patience for that, but you know, maybe someday I will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're talking about gluing, uh, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, there's no right way or wrong way to do this stuff, just different ways. And, you know, some do work better than others. Um, one popular way to glue it, uh, to glue up segments, is, is do what they call rub joints. And that's where you simply take. Uh, Hmm. I keep losing stuff here. Uh, you take a ring and uh, apply glue to two mating surfaces and and rub them together on a flat surface, and this works. It works really well. Uh, it doesn't take very, especially with tight bond original. Uh, it only takes a few seconds for that glue to start to tack, and once it started to tack, if you don't abuse the the little glue up that you've done, uh, it'll hold together for you in in perpetuity. 
and you do a bunch of those, and once you get a bunch of little, you know, like two segment uh, uh, pieces assembled, then you start putting them together. The problem with that, in, in, in my experience is, is if I'm off a smidgen on one of those, if I don't have it quite perfect, my whole ring is off. It also takes time, and it also can be messy. There are other ways to glue that I've tried and haven't had a great deal of success with. So I don't think I, 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 I saw something like this, but I've never seen one that's done exactly the way that I do it, so I guess I'll claim uh, ownership of this. I made a gluing jig, and let me put it over there, Clay. Uh, it's a little work to, to, to make the jig itself. Uh, well, what this is, you've all seen these. This is a cutting board. You can buy these at Walmart. I forget how much I gave for it. But what it is, it's a one inch thick piece of high density uh, polyethylene. And, you know, the reason that I like this is that glue doesn't stick to it. Uh, if, if it dries to it, it'll tack to it a little bit, but you can wash it right off so it's easy to keep clean. And these are very sophisticated little pins that are otherwise known as galvanized box nails. You can buy them by the box at Menards or Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever. And the reason for the pins, put a rubber band around them. And uh, need a little glue. Rather than, you know, try to squirt the glue out of a bottle or, you know, something else, I made a little well over here with a router bit. So, put a little glue in the well. And then we can start doing our rings. And by the way, it's a good idea to count them before you start gluing, because once you start gluing, you don't have any opportunity to go looking for the one that you lost. By the way, has anybody ever calculated how much time you spend looking for the tool that you had in your hand five minutes ago? I don't know. And you know, my grandson was over in my shop a couple months ago, and one of my flashlights came up. I've got those little cheap flashlights that Harbor Freight gives you free once in a while. One of my little flashlights came up missing. Well, you know, with the, you know, uh, eyes that aren't as young as they used to be, I, I need flashlights for a lot of stuff. And I couldn't find this flashlight. And I said, damn it, Ryan took that flashlight. I know he did. So, you know, I'm over to his, his, his mom's house. And I went and looked in his room because I figured, you know, that he has a tendency to empty his pockets out in his room, and I figured I'd find no, no flashlight. So I'm looking for that flashlight for two or three months. I finally go out and use the coupon to get another free one at Menards, or at uh, Home Depot. Harbor Freight, I'm sorry. And uh, I get home, and I'm going through a cutoff bin that I've got under my table saw. There's the flashlight. I have no. I didn't, never used it down there. I have no idea how it got there. Uh, I lose tape measures, uh, you know. So I guess it's a product of being ex as experienced as I am. I don't know. Uh, what I'm going to do here is put a dab of glue just on one end. Now, conventional wisdom is is that you glue both sides. You I don't think you really have to. You can if you want to. The reason I don't is it takes more time. And you'll also notice as I put these in, these were cut with the idea that they were going to be done in uh, economy mode. So I'm going to alternate. And by the way, I'm not letting them touch right away. If they, if they, if they touch and I leave them that way, it starts a chemical reaction that after a few seconds you cannot break. Well, you can break it, but then you, have, you, you go cut another piece and start over again. <coughs> I 
It's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Just wait till you have to watch it dry. Yeah, there are, there are a couple of really nice software packages out there that, you know, if you want to invest uh, a little money in them, uh, that will c do the calculation for you, and you can draw a picture of your, of your ball or whatever it is you're turning. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, I do use uh, one called Woodturner Pro. Uh, but the reality is there also are some websites where you can get the, uh, uh, you can actually do your design work and save your segments in project files online at no cost at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, Tom asked a good question there that I, I probably should have mentioned what I was doing. As soon as I had the glue on, I started pulling the pins out to release the rubber band. The rubber band actually does, you know, the beginning of the work for me. And once I get all the pins out, then I just go through and I make sure uh, uh, all the segments are snug. And I just wipe this off with uh, a, a, a rag and water, and I'm ready to go for the next ring. Tight bond, tight bond one. It it tacks like within two or three minutes. Uh, you need at least 15 minutes. I never push it, uh, and let me tell you why. Um, even though it's, it appears to be dry, it's still curing inside. And this is not the last step in this process. This is only another step to get there. I still need to sand these to flatten them. And you would not believe uh, uh, how, much, uh, how many sanding belts I've ruined with glue in them. That, you know, two hours after I had, had done the glue up on these, and made, you know, gotten them nice and tight, got my squeeze out, wiped them down, done everything I'm supposed to do. And still, I'd, after I'd run them through the, uh, the drum sander, uh, I'd wind up with little spots of glue on it. And pretty soon you have a, a, a belt that's, that's creating grooves. You don't want that. So I, I let these dry. Uh, for me, when I'm doing uh, like those yarn bowls, uh, these will dry overnight. And then I'll flatten them the next morning and assemble the rings the next morning. And, you know, that way I don't have any problem with, uh, with glue residue in the sander. And then after I assemble the rings and, and glue, you know, get them glued up into a stack, I'll let them sit for sometimes a day or two, sometimes a week, and sometimes longer. Uh, it just depends on whatever else I've got doing. One of those bowls takes me about four hours to make total, but that's four hours over two or three days. So. You know, I'm, I, I've got other little stuff that I'm working on or I'm, you know, doing, you know, yard work or whatever else in the meantime. Oh, uh, no less than 24 hours. M and more if you can get it. Well, what happens is if you push it too much, you can turn these. But the problem is you're going to wind up plugging your gouge up because if, you hit, if you're hitting glue pockets in there that aren't quite cured yet, it's like a real thick gum, so you wind up having to, you know, clean the gouge out and and so forth. And what I started doing with uh, uh, segmented vessels, again, it, it comes down to how you know how fast you want to do them, you know, you know, speed up the process. 
I do the outside with a with high speed gouge. Uh, I really like the you know the Ellsworth grind five eighths inch high speed gouge. I can do a lot of work on the outside with that and come up pretty much with a, with a finished product with m minimal amount of sanding that needs to be done. The inside's a different story. On the inside, you know, just to get them done relatively quickly and cleanly and consistently and all that. Uh, what I do there is I've got a Harrison uh, simple hollower and I use the carbide bit with it, the, the carbide cutter, and that's how I do the insides on them. You know, I've I've never been a big fan of carbides. I, I think high speed tools give you a high speed steel gives you a much cleaner cut. But the truth of the matter is, for you know what I'm doing with these yarn bowls, I'm not sure exactly how clean the cut necessarily has to be. It needs to be consistent more than anything else and not have any gaps in it. And you can do that pretty easy with a carbide tool. So well now we've got our ring done. Uh I guess we could pass that around. Uh, we need to uh, we need to assemble the stack, and for, for the stack, what we've done been doing, there like I say again, there are a number of ways to do this, and I've done it with it's something as simple as a two before and a pair of clamps. Uh, I've done it in you know the the, the big vise on my workbench. I've got a a, a a twelve inch vise that opens up to eighteen inches, so I can do a pretty good sized piece in there. But what I've kind of settled on is something called the stomper. And it looks like a combination of a, you know, a lawn sprinkler and a Longworth chuck. And if it looks like that, that's exactly what it is. Uh, the uh, bottom here is a, a piece of uh, a Schedule 40 PVC. And is it, what is it, a rainbird? Is that what the, the, what the sprinkler is? Anyway, the, the yeah. Yeah, the guy on the Seg Easy website details how you do this. The thing that's nice about this is that you can adjust the uh, the diameter to fit your ring. And this one's not going to not going to adjust right, but it it pretty much perfectly centers the ring, and then you put your uh, face plate. Or you know your first ring, or or you know your your uh, disc, or whatever, on top of this, and let it squeeze down, spring loaded. And then when you uh, get your piece on, and, you, and I, I you know some guys do a multiple, I do one at a time. Uh, I found this at Goodwill for five bucks. This is a ten pound weight, and the way it works is real simple. Um, in the bottom of my bowl here, by the way, I, uh, I've done 39 of those yarn bowls. This is number 40. A uh, week from now, it'll probably be done someplace in somebody's hands. Uh, we'll pass this around, but in the bottom of it here, uh, there's a piece of plywood, just a, 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 a chunk of junk that I cut, and it's, it's not glued on, it's hot glued. I use hot glue because, you know, once I'm done using it, uh, for the purpose that I'm going to show you here, uh, I just take a heat gun and, and you know heat it up good in the bottom, and the, the the hot glue pops right off, and I don't have to waste any wood. Now the way that the guy on the website that that sells the uh, stomper material and does all this other stuff, the way he'll tell you to do it is to drill a five eighths inch hole in the first ring in your bowl or in the base of your bowl. You can do that, but you're also going to waste wood. Uh, and if you're, you know, depending on how thick your your ring is, you can get pretty close to the bottom by accident. And you don't, you want these to be bowls, not funnels. So uh, I put this little piece of plywood in. It's got a five eighths inch piece, uh, five eighths inch hole drilled in the plywood. So I use that to register. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's assume we put glue on, and I had had marked the registration lines on this. When you get when I pass this around, you'll notice that there's a, a series of lines here. Those are the registration lines that I use, you know, when I do the assembly when I'm stacking these. Uh, before I uh, before I do any gluing of the rings, after I got them flattened, uh, I'll sit down and figure out, you know, where the uh, the, the glue joints are. And I do alternate the glue joints on them. I don't like to have two end grain glue joints adjacent to each other. I like to alternate them. 
And you know, so I, I, I draw these out, apply the glue, and then build the ring this way. And what I'll normally do, again, because I'm, I'm using tight bond one, uh, what I'll normally do is I'll give it 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then put another, another ring on and keep building rings. I do these two at a time. Uh, usually, if I've got a, a segmenting project going, it's usually one or two. And the reason for that is that while I'm doing this on one, I can be doing something else on the other one so I can keep moving on the project. Or I'll just go out and, and you know, have a cup of coffee and do something else while the glue is drying. Um, one other question that comes up once in a while is, well, what about your chuck? I don't use chuck on any segmenting project. Very rarely would I ever use a chuck on them. Face plates are relatively cheap. I've got, I, I bought a couple of aluminum face plates and I've got a couple that I bought with my lathe. So what I do is I attach a, uh, a face plate to a waste block and you'll notice that there's a line on the waste block, on, uh, on the glue block here. That's so I know how deep the screws are in the uh, face plate. And I'll, I don't know how many times I've used this face plate, but what I will do is uh, when I get down close to that line, I'll part that off close to the line and glue another waste block on in front of it so it gets longer again. And then I just keep going down. But the reason I don't use a chuck is because, you know, you, you can have uh, registration problems with chucks. If you're, you're dismounting this and, and, and remounting it in your chuck, you always have the potential to get a little bit off because we know that you can have, a, you know, be a little bit out of, out of concentricity. I've never had a faceplate uh, go wrong on me. So, and I do use, by the way, uh, I don't use uh, wood screws. Uh, I don't use uh, drywall screws. I only use uh, number 10 or number 12 sheet metal screws uh, in the faceplates. And the reason for that is the sheet metal screws take a, uh, give you a better bite, I think. And the sheet metal screws are designed to hold up under more of the torque that you're going to put this thing through. Because when I'm turning this on the lathe, it, one of the reasons I use the carbide cutter, I'm not real careful about it. You know, I mean, I go at it like crazy, and sometimes I'll get some pretty good catches inside there. And as long as I don't tear out so much wood that I can't repair it, I don't care because it's moving wood out of the way. And if I were using a chuck, I'd probably have it off on the floor. Uh, one inch and an inch and a quarter. Uh, I have I have two styles of face plates. Uh, I have uh, a set of face plates that were designed for my uh, old Delta lathe, and I use and they have a they have a thinner plate on them. And so I usually will use uh, 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 inch and a quarter on them, or I'm sorry, inch on them, and on these face plates I'll use inch and a quarter. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. I, uh, uh, you know, you you can use you know a square drive if you want or Phillips, but I use a, a, a hex head that I can use my little driver here. What have we not covered, Al? Oh, let's see here. Uh, we brought so many toys, I feel like I have something. Oh, yeah, there is one thing. Uh, somebody, you know, was asking me how I do the J-slot and the yarn bowls. And this is kind of off the subject of segmenting, but, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it a little bit anyway. Uh, a little over two years ago, in the American Wood Turner, the AAW Journal, a guy did an article on how he does slots and yarn bowls. And I read the article, and he does it in a couple of different ways, and this is the way that he preferred, so I kind of copied his jig. Um, it's a real simple setup. It takes a little while to uh, to construct the jig. And if you're only going to do one yarn bowl, this may not be worth your time. But if you're going to do multiples, this is definitely worth your time. Because trying to cut those damn slots with a coping saw and a dremel, which is the way most guys try to do them, can really be an exasperating experience. I, I did one that way. That's why I decided to build the jig. I wasn't going to do that again. Um, all it is is a, a set of plywood platforms, and you know, these are lined with uh, uh, like the craft foam that you can buy at you know Hobby Lobby or someplace like that, just to hold the bowl in place. And put the bowl in. 
And by the way, this is a bowl that I wasn't sure what I was going to do with this one. I don't think I can get it out of there. Yeah, it's not going to come out. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with this. This bowl's got as much epoxy in it as it does wood. I had a heck of a time holding it together. But, you know, it came out, you know, fairly nice, and my wife likes it, so I think this is going to be a yarn bowl for her, you know, like she needs another one. But uh, you put the, well, look, I got the yarn, I keep getting back to the yarn bowls. Two years ago, uh, she went to uh, some yarn shop over in Minnesota, someplace with a couple of her friends. And she came back with a picture on her cell phone of one of these bowls that she saw uh, in this store. And she says, you could make me one of these. Because if your wife ever says that to you, run. I made one for her. I looked at it and thought, well, it's just a bowl with a thing cut in. It should be a big deal. So I made one for her. And she took it to her yarn club or knitting club meeting. And all of her friends had to have one. So I thought, well, you know, if I, I, I'd have to have something for them. So I figured out about what they might cost to make and stuff. I've now made 39 of them. The one that we're passing around here is number 40. Uh, and I, 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 I do sell them. I've got them in, in two stores in the area. Uh, and, you know, my price on them is 70 bucks. I don't care what the store sells them for. They can sell them for any amount of money they want. They are kind of a popular item, but, you know, they also can be a pain in the ass. They can take a little time. Each one of them probably takes me about four hours to make. Uh, it takes me a lot less time since I came up with this system because you mount the yarn, the, the bowl in, the blank bowl, and figure out, and I usually just draw it with a uh, a piece of chalk or something about where I want the slot. And then I made a template up. And I've actually got a couple of these templates. This is the one that I like the best and is, you know seems to give me the nicest result. And the template is, uh, I, I you know, it, it takes a while to make the template because this has to be as perfectly smooth as you can get it. Uh, and then it's got a series of holes along here so you can adjust it for different size holes. And lay it down and figure out about where it hits your bowl where you want it. Uh, I'm going to press it down here and then just insert the, sc the, the screws back. The screws are, are uh, uh, designed, they're machine screws so they go in flush. And uh, get in there. I think my battery is going down on me, too. Okay. Um, and now I've got the bowl mounted. I take a, uh, a, a plunge router. You can use a straight router, a, you know, a fixed base that you just adjust down. I like a plunge because you're doing really tiny increments down, and the plunge is just a little faster to me. But what I use is uh, a spiral upcut bit, a quarter inch spiral upcut bit that's running inside a 5 16 bushing. And for if those of you that have routers and are, are, are into router uh, 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 woodworking, uh, the bushing set that I used is a standard that Porter Cable developed many years ago. I happen to have DeWalt routers, so my Porter Cable bushings fit perfectly in them. And all I do then is, is run the, uh, the bushing into the slot and, and keep going down gradually. The spiral upcut bit is the key to it. Don't use a straight bit uh, because you're dealing with, first of all, in most cases, kind of an irregular surface here. A straight bit will just raise hell with the wood grain. It'll tear it out all over the place. Uh, a spiral upcut bit, if you look at a, a spiral upcut bit from, you know, at the end of it, the flues simply go up like this towards the center of the bit. So what's happening is, as the bit rotates, it's pulling the waste material in instead of out. Uh, a straight bit or a, 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 a spiral downcut bit will push the material out. Spiral upcut brings the material in and ejects it up through the flute. That's another reason why I take such, such tiny bites with it. I don't want to run the risk of plugging that bit up because it's, it is running in a, almost a little tube uh, up through the bushing. So you've got to make sure that you're you know, giving it an, enough time to get the waste material out of there. And just keep going until I get all the way through. And I also cut two holes 
uh, in each one for, uh, for needle storage. And just do those with the plunge router too with the same bit. Then when I get done with the, with the routing, usually the only cleanup work that I have to do is on the outside surface. There will be some tear out on the outside surface, but with a good sharp bit, it's usually not a problem to clear up. The thing that I, I really appreciate about it is is that I have almost no cleanup of any kind on the inside. I get a pretty straight, uh, a nice clean cut on the inside. I think that's about it. Questions? I only do one, and the reason for that is that I'm afraid if I cut too much, I'm going to weaken the bowl. It, well, this bowl, for example, uh, you take a look at that. That's mostly epoxy. I don't want to get anywhere close to that because I don't know how solid that is. And what I really don't want to have happen is I don't want to sell this bowl to somebody and in a year have them come back and say it fell apart. So I only do the one cut in them. Now, there is a, there is a design that some people are, are, are voicing an interest in to do multiples, but that's actually two separate vessels that are joined together. Uh, I've never seen one that does, actually I have. There's somebody that makes them out of pottery material that does wa a slot on each side. I don't, I haven't had anybody ask for that though. Any other questions? Okay. Hey, like I say, there's a, a sign-up sheet back there if you want instructions for the wedgie sled system and the stop. Uh, you know, sign up and I'll, I'll get the stuff out to you in email later this week. And, oh, and by the way, I want to thank you, Kelly, for the use of your saw. We, when we started talking about doing this, I said, how are we going to do this? Because the school saw probably really isn't appropriate for this purpose. And Kelly was kind enough to volunteer the use of his uh, job site saw, so thank you. <laughs>